would you consider to be your biggest success in your fashion career? God. Uh, closing it, I would think, <laughs> would be my idea of my biggest success. When I, the day I stopped, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> I was absolutely devastated, as were all the industry and his customer base, um, because he was so successful, so successful. We, we couldn't believe it. He was a big designer. When I came across him, it was exciting to design for somebody who'd been so prolific and made such beautiful clothes. And he had, you know, incredible clients and very glamorous shows and fantastic models that he would always sort of have from Paris for his show. So he was always on a very um, beautiful kind of level. It's very important in life to know when something is over and not just battle on when it's actually, it's run its time. And I think, and I also wanted a different kind of life. You know, if you're, if you're working in fashion like that, you're stuck in London all the time and you can't leave it for a minute. And I just thought, you know, I was 46, 45 or whatever I was. I just thought, you know, I've got another 20, 25 years to work full time. Do I want to spend them doing this? That's a very simple answer, no. So I went to live in Spain and um, started painting. Somebody told me about um, a teacher in London called David Cranswick. He is a very, very good teacher. He teaches sort of Renaissance techniques of preparing canvases or wooden panels and how to grind your paints. Was it quite a lot of that new to you? Oh, it's completely, yes. I didn't know anything about the techniques of, of painting. And I didn't know how, if you did an oil painting, how would you stop it falling off the canvas? Well, it doesn't fall off, but I mean, you see what I mean. Uh, one of the most impressive things about Victor is that when he stopped, he wasn't bitter or twisted about his fashion experience. He just um, very um, patiently decided on another ca entire career, and a career that is actually very difficult because you can't do that kind of thing without talent. I've always drawn a lot because you have to draw when you're designing, so I've always drawn, and then on so the last couple of summer holidays, in the last couple of years, I was still at my company. I was painting a lot on holiday, and I just thought, you know, this is really exciting. It's what I really want to do. And um, so I did. There's no other designer, probably Karl Lagerfeld, but certainly no other designer I can remember who would do such intricate drawings that were actually a work of art. What I like to do is it's calculated until the end when I can then sort of work quite freely on what I'm doing because I know that what I'm hanging it on is, is, a, is, a, is sound. Every detail, even the buttons, were from this incredible place in Paris. Th the thread had to be a certain thread and so on. Accountants don't understand that. So if he couldn't do it to the level he wanted to do it to, he'd prefer to walk away. <laughs> When I was uh, about 18, I went to work in France for a little while. They have a way of making clothes and an understanding of handling fabrics, and the whole approach is, um, I'm afraid, infinitely superior. I always used to feel, in fact, the same way I feel when I paint someone's portrait, 
that when you make someone a dress or paint their portrait, you've got to make the thing a collaboration, not a confrontation. It's very important, so you do it together, and so the final result is what you're, you've achieved together and you're happy with it. If they're not happy with it, they're only too happy to talk about it to their friends, and it doesn't do you any good. When I was at Dior, each season we would go to the Paris to see the collection and go through all the clothes, and we used to take whatever patterns we wanted to reproduce them in London. And that was really an extremely valuable education. I mean, in a way, it almost would have been worth paying them to work there for that. Victor shows, because they were couture, very much like the French couture houses, extremely intimate, and you had to be invited. Your dressers knew everything about the actual frock and how it was made. So, but Victor would always stand just before you went on stage just to check the last, you know, tweak and, and put it, put it in, in, in context. He did the whole show, so he kind of slightly introduced me to a, how it, what it was like to work with the designer and also to the whole world of, you know, what a fashion show was about and what it took to actually um, develop a, a collection. I certainly never had these sort of anorexic 12-year-olds that they have now, which I do find quite strange. It's very unattractive. Um, I don't understand that too well of having girls who look as if they've been taking drugs and have thrown up everything they've ever eaten. I, I don't know, it's, um, I find it pretty weird. One of the most exciting things for a designer working with a model is that when you have a very good model who really understands clothes and knows how to move, that she puts on something you've designed and somehow shows you something about it you didn't even know it had, if you can understand what I mean. Whereas you see these models now walking up and down, and it's as though they have no awareness of what they've got on at all. It falls off their shoulder, whatever. They don't, they seem to have no relation to it. They just plonk up and down a catwalk. I find quite strange, but then perhaps I'm just getting old. I don't know. <laughs> the place that I really loved working at was Bieber. One felt one was working at the centre of the world of fashion, and in a way it was. Because, you know, whereas other fashion houses struggle with uh, fashion editors to get their clothes uh, featured and photographed, we were fighting them off. It was the only firm I ever worked for where I really admired the clothes they were making. You know, when Victor actually went off and started his own couture house, it was quite incredible because anybody can go in there if you were size 5 or size 8 or size 0, whatever, to a size 20, and he would make you look awesome. It was almost embarrassing because he was more excited about the hats than sometimes he was. You know, he loved the idea of, you know, how of a, a great hat with uh, his clothes because his customers um, were the kind of people who did really wear uh, the whole look. It helped a lot when Vogue took an interest in what I did and, and photographed things. Uh, but it's a, it, uh, there's no one particular thing, it, it just builds little by little. And I, <clears throat> and I suppose what also gave a tremendous boost was when I started making dresses for the Princess of Wales because obviously the publicity that generated was huge. And although nobody ever walked in and said, I've come to you because you make dresses for the Princess of Wales, I dare say some did. I've no stage has the pace slowed while the most famous dresses have been going for extraordinary prices. Even the less well-remembered, the less fancied items have been fetching tens of thousands of dollars. But the best was to be the dress in which she met the Reagan and then danced with John Travolta. 200,000 last time. £120,000 for a single dress. 
Well, the thing about that, that dress is when people rang me up on the night from America asking about it, I didn't actually design it for her. It was just a dress in our collection. And, um, and she chose it, and I had no idea when she was going to wear it. I don't suppose she did either, because she would you know, order dresses at the beginning of a season. Obviously, she was going to need some evening dresses. Um, so it was as, as much of a surprise to me as anyone else that she would have worn it for that night. You know, one never knew. Um, and I, I guess the uh, excitement over that dress was really because uh, it was at the White House and she danced with John Travolta. Um, other than that, it was a perfectly OK dress, you know. It had a lot of fuss made about it. <laughs> She used to come to the rehearsals of my fashion show. She couldn't come to the actual show because then it would have been such a song and dance. And after the rehearsal, she used to go around to the back and talk to all the dressmakers who obviously did all the dressing. And she used to talk to them all. She remembered their names. She used to say, which dress did you make? Oh, that's the one I like best. And so on and on. I mean, when she, by the time she'd gone, they were all three feet in the air. And she really had that effect on people. You know, you, you must realise he's come from a tailoring background, so he's... And pl plus he's very shy. And tailors are very much the backstage of everything. Um, but of course, when Diana, when Princess Diana, um, started wearing his clothes, he then became very front stage. When Victor, um, when Victor retired, I, um, I wasn't surprised because the... Um, you know, to work at that level constantly, uh, season after season, is um, very difficult. Could you tell he was stressed then? Good God, no. We had no clue. He always wore this wonderful smile, and he's very, very tall, very imposing. He's almost a Gatsby-like character. You know, you can just see him flapping around with those wonderful Oxfords and so on. He just had the best character. We couldn't believe it, and we went round to see him, in fact, and said, my goodness, you know, why are you doing this? And he said, it's time to move on. Um, but the way in which he said it, you just knew that he didn't want that world anymore. I suppose I find painting preferable to dress designing because I'm in control of what I do. When you work in fashion, I couldn't sit and make every dress. So you have to delegate, you know, do the drawing, and then you've got to delegate to the person who cuts the pattern and the dressmaker and so on. And so often what I did fell short of what I'd hoped it would be. Whereas now with a painting, it's just me. So often, obviously, during the course of doing a painting, it does fall short, but then you carry on working on it and you make it what you wanted it to be. Well, I've always been extremely interested in interiors. You know, I used to invent rooms when I was even still at school. So it was rather inevitable that when I started painting, I would do interiors. So I do, what I find so fascinating is light coming into an interior and what it does. That for me is the spur to paint interiors. And also I, I'm very interested in finding places, which was why I did my first exhibition of in, interiors in Venice is to find rooms that are untouched that haven't been changed for a very very long time. I think his paintings are fabulous. I actually own three of them and I think they're absolutely beautiful. His paintings have got a hint of the 30s don't you think? The 30s and 40s and 50s um, because they're just so old world and old school and he's such a perfectionist. He just muted beautifully everything, just, and the dark and light and, you know, seeing, you know, he's actually able to see every detail and, and through his eyes, you know, just, just quite beautiful. Before I ever started painting, I did look at that Sir Brown still life. And they, well, what is it? Why does one find that so beautiful? Is it just the brilliance of the way the surfaces of all the things are painted? Well, it is that. And I realise that what it really is, is the use of the light. The way the light falls on everything in the picture, that's what makes it so stunning. And that, for me, has always been the spur to paint, is what light does. That's the, because, because, in a way, that's the energy in a picture. Without the light, you're not going to see anything. 
So it is the most important thing. So when you see paintings that don't have a great sense of light, they are a bit dull. With what I do in my painting, I'm just constantly trying to improve and perfect what I do. And each um, portrait I do or room I paint is a new challenge. And, it's, and the, the, the challenge is to capture it. And that's what I find really intriguing and so satisfying. When I've had a good day's painting, it doesn't always good, when I have a good day's painting, the elation and um, contentment that I feel is, is, is infinitely superior to how one ever might have felt really about dresses, even if you made a, a dress for someone and they were terribly happy and that's all very nice. But it's not quite the same thing as that sort of a challenge of, of doing a painting and getting it really right. Or that is for me, or perhaps for other people, maybe making a very successful dress would be. And perhaps that's why I shouldn't be doing it anymore because I find painting gives me that enormous satisfaction and also makes one feel how I feel in life that nothing gives one more stimulation and sort of feeling it than, one, than work. It's the most important thing. I feel so sorry for people who have no work. It must be so demoralising for them to sort of step out of, out of life, really. Will that do?